And I speak in the name of the Holy and Undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Over the centuries, there have been many, many, many different interpretations of this particular parable. It may be referring to the black mustard plant, which grows up to nine feet tall and originates in a very small seed. It's an annual plant, and the Jews did not grow it in their garden. It grows like weeds, and it's hard to get rid of. Part of the parable may be saying that the kingdom of God begins from its tiny beginnings, becomes worldwide in its side, size. In the reverence to the birds who nested in it, it may refer to the universal reach of God's kingdom, empire. It may refer to Gentiles seeking refuge with Israel, or sinners, or tax collectors, or even false prophets. It appeared small like a seed during Jesus' ministry to grow in something large and firmly rooted. Some would find shelter in its branches. Others would find it obnoxious and try to root it out. Another way of looking at this parable might be this. Some things need to be left alone. If we keep exposing the seed to air, it will not germinate. Not everything or everyone needs constant attention. We are part of a larger process. We may start an action, but that action can often get on its own quite well without our interference. Because sometimes we simply need to get out of the way. We, believe it or not, are not always the focus. Sometimes we are the facilitator of something bigger than ourselves. The sowing is much less important than the tree to which the seed grows. The important thing is the result of the action. And finally, part of this interpretation talks about it is a domestic concern. The parable is set in a garden or in a field, possibly in our own backyard. The generosity of nature and daily working together of men and women is shown here. The kingdom is present when humanity and nature work together. We do what we were put to do here, to go out on a limb and provide for others and ourselves as well. There are 119 references to the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God in the New Testament. We can use these two terms interchangeably, but it is a pretty important topic. Some scholars would say that it is of the ultimate importance, that the reason that Jesus came to earth was to preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is like yeast, or leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in sort of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king <coughs> excuse me, who wished to settle accounts with his servants. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net, which was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. For the, <coughs> for the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. I'm not going to read all 119 references to the kingdom of God, but just a few more. The kingdom of God may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son, then the kingdom of God shall be compared to ten maidens who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. For the kingdom of God will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted them to his property. The kingdom of God is as if, it's like, it may be compared, it shall be compared, it will be as. There's lots of things the kingdom of God is like, but the Bible does never get around to telling us what the kingdom of God is. The Bible tells us who the kingdom of God is for. Blessed are the poor, or poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such truly belongs the kingdom of God. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. How hard it will be for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. So the kingdom of God is for the poor, for those perse persecuted for righteousness sake, for children, for tax collectors, and for harlots. You kind of have to ask the question, where does that put the rest of us? N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, tells us that the kingdom of God never ever refers to heaven pure and simple. It always refers to God's kingdom coming on earth as in heaven. Heaven, if you will, is God's space. Earth is our space. Earth is not a training ground for heaven. Heaven and earth are designed to overlap and interlock. We talk about it in the sacraments an outward and visible sign of inward and spiritual grace, the point where heaven and earth intersect. God is made known to us in the breaking of the bread, where heaven and earth meet, in the real presence of the sacrament of the bread and wine. Heaven and earth also intersect at times in our own lives. We call these times thin places, where the veil between the sacred and the secular between the godly and the earthly are gossamer thin, thin places. <clears throat> One of those places for me is Shark Cathedral. Years ago, my wife and I went and visited that part of France. It was long before the magnificent stained glass windows in that cathedral were cleaned. The interior was dark, gloomy. It was lit only by candles. Lindsay and I walked around the cathedral separately and about an hour later emerged into the sunlight and sat on the steps. Both overwhelmed with the experience. We could barely speak. We had been in a thin place together in the presence of God. Some of you all know the piece of music, Allegre's Miserere. The first time I think I remember hearing it performed <coughs> was by the Choral Arts Ensemble a group here in Kansas City many years ago, who were performing at the Nelson Atkins Art Museum. They were in procession singing Allegre's Miserere. That haunting falling note, echoing off those hard, flat surfaces of the museum, it was an absolutely otherworldly quality. I experienced the sense of the presence of God. It is not unlike a thin place, Maybe we might want to call it a thin experience for the lack of a better word. In those places, I sense the presence of the kingdom of God. It's more than saying the kingdom of God is like, it is more powerful and real, it is a fleeting glimpse of the divine when heaven and earth overlap, where we can begin to imagine just what the kingdom of God is like and why we would want to be part of it here and now, and in the world to come. I'd like to close with a couple of thoughts from Jim Wallace. I think they pertain to what it means to talk about the kingdom of God. I remember a conference in New York City. The topic was social justice. Assembled for the meeting were theologians, pastors, priests, nuns, and lay church leaders. At one point, a Native American stood up and looked out over the mostly white audience and said, regardless of what the New Testament says, most Christians are materialists with no experience of the spirit. Regardless of what the New Testament says, most Christians are individualists with no real experience of community. He paused for a moment and then continued. Let's pretend that you are all Christians. 
If you were Christians, you would no longer accumulate. You would share everything you had. You would actually love one another, and you would treat each other as if you were family. His eyes were piercing as he asked, why don't you do that? Why don't you live that way? Amen.